Thank you very much for joining in this Bible study. I am super excited that today we are starting the book of Romans. So if this is your first time joining in my Bible studies, I'm gonna give you, um, we're gonna go through a few things. First of all, I'm gonna explain what each of these studies are, uh, what the structure is, what you are getting into in these weekly studies. Uh, second, I'm gonna talk about who am I and why should you listen to me? Uh, and then third, um, we're gonna do something a little bit unique to this series, uh, unique in comparison to what we've done when we went through Matthew and what we went through Acts. And then we're actually gonna open up the Bible and talk about Romans. And this week we're gonna look at just the first 17 verses of Romans. So before we dig into all of this, I'm just gonna pray real quick and bless this time and uh, submit it to God. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you will be with each person as they watch, as they listen, and speak through me, Lord. Teach us something new, help us to rely more on you, and help us to remove whatever is hindering us in our relationship with you. We love you, Lord, and give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, okay, so what these are is a weekly Bible study. My goal in doing these is to help the Christian learn their Bible better. It occurred to me a couple years ago that there are so many people that on a weekly basis go to church, but they don't actually let God change them. They don't actually let this book radically change their lives for the better. They are what I would call consumer Christians. They simply go to church uh, on Sunday, listen to the message, um, praise God for that hour or so, and then they go about their daily lives. And it was heavy on my heart with this realization that if just 50% of the people that go to church that profess to be Christians learn their Bible better, they would be closer to God and they would hear God's call in their life and they would change. They would change in the way that God wants them to change in the way that they want to change. So my goal is this is a supplemental study that is designed to help you learn the Bible better and through that, grow closer in your relationship with God. That's the goal. Another thing we're doing uniquely uh, is I am going to make sure to do a better job of following my notes so that I don't go on massive tangents. We will still go on, on some tangents. Um, my goal is that you'll learn something new uh, and perhaps some new perspective, some new way of um, seeing the scripture on a week to week basis that you'll step away from this being like, huh, I never thought of it that way. I am currently going through a master's in biblical studies and you will see the fruit of that in these in these studies that we're doing. Hermeneutics and exegesis is a very academic and fancy way of saying studying the Bible, more or less. How we study and the actual study of scripture. From that, the most important thing and takeaway is that historical, cultural context, context is everything. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, let's take Romans for example. If you just simply read the book of Romans and immediately say, okay, what does this mean for me today? You are not getting the full impact of the scripture. Why? Because the first thing that we must do when studying the Bible is to look at what is going on in that time frame, the culture and the history wrapped around that in the environment, in the culture, but then also in the author's life, what is happening in their life, and who are they speaking to, and what is happening in the lives of the, the people that they're speaking to uh, as their audience. Once you first solve that, of the who, what, where, when, why, so to speak, of the text, you can then understand what the goal was of the original author to the original audience in that day. Then, and only then, are you in a position where you can now look at the scriptures and say, okay, that was the context then, what then is my takeaway today? But you must go through that process first to really understand uh, what God's trying to tell us. Because what was God trying to tell 
Paul to speak through to the Romans at the very beginning of the century, in uh, around 57 AD. Once we look at that first, then we can then look at application. So that's my goal, is, is that each week I am going to open up the scriptures to you with historical cultural context. That's my job, is to do the research. These are the five books that uh, I will reference each week. I might not use them each week, but as I use them, I will put the reference in the notes on YouTube um, so that you can find these books. Uh, you don't have to buy them, but I simply, I wanna cite my sources so you know where I'm getting the information that I'm getting. Okay. Okay, so the goal is that you will become the man or woman that you are capable of becoming through learning the Bible better and allowing God to change you from the inside out. That's my goal. Okay, so who am I and why should you listen to me? My name's Dave. Hi. I have been a Christian for about 21 years. I'm from Seattle originally. Then I lived in Colorado for about eight years or so. Got married there, got my undergrad, got my master's, my first master's there. Then my wife and I, Celicia is her name and she will come up quite often. Um, she and I then moved to Portland, Oregon, where we lived there for three years, and then we moved here in 2009, which is upstate New York, Saratoga Springs, and we've lived here ever since. I am vocationally, I am a photographer. We are here in my portrait studio, Saratoga Portrait Studio, uh, where we do each of these studies. Um, I love mountain biking, I love road biking, I love fat biking, basically any type of biking. I'm an avid cyclist. I also enjoy running, and my wife and I enjoy doing triathlons um, together in the sense that we'll travel to do a triathlon. Um, she's a, a, about a foot shorter than I am and has a totally different build and design than I do. So we don't compete in triathlons at the same rate, and I don't know why I am still talking about that. I also have, my wife and I don't have kids, but we would call them our children, uh, our, our two Bernie's Mountain Dogs. Kenzie, who is right here, uh, joins me every study. She will be at my feet. She is, uh, she's my dog. She is at my feet wherever I go and is an incredibly sweet Bernie's Mountain Dog. Lexi is a spaz and a psycho, but we still love her. She is at home with mom. Today is her day off. And so Kenzie gets the office to herself. That's me. In a nutshell, I am currently working my way through a master's in biblical studies and will be done uh, next fall is when I'm gonna be done with that. So there you go, that's me. So one thing that we're doing unique this go round is I want to know who you are. A lot of you who watch have emailed me uh, saying thank you and I appreciate that. But I'm asking you at the end of this study this week to shoot me an email. I wanna know who is listening, who is watching, where do you live? Uh, do you have kids? What's going on in your life? Uh, what is a challenge that you're working through in your walk? As a Christian, becoming a Christian is not a destination, it is a journey and we are all working towards becoming more Christ-like. God is working in every single one of us continually and if he's not, he should be and that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. So. Another thing we're doing uniquely this go round is that at the end of each week, if something comes up, if you have a question, shoot me an email with your questions. And at the very last study, likely we'll do it with Romans 16 because Romans 16 um, is the last chapter and uh, um, some scholars actually believe that 16 was added on as an attachment to only a handful of the transcripts that were sent to specific churches. Romans 16 is really just a greeting from Paul uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the uh, Tartarus, Tartarus, I think is his name. Uh, I didn't write it down. I didn't um, know I was going to talk about him, but he is the actual person who's, who's penning the letter. But the two of them greet a bunch of people. It's a whole bunch of greetings that they give to a whole bunch of different people. It's basically like, hey, say hi to Susie. Say hi to Priscilla and Aquila. Say hi to so-and-so. Say hi to so-and-so. They were awesome. Say hi to Bob. Say hi to, you know, whoever. So that's going to be a very fast study because there's not a whole lot of revelation we can get from that. And at the end of that, depending on how many questions I get, we will do a Q uh, and A. I will read your questions and answer them as best I can. 
So I want this study to be a bit more interactive. Each week, the videos go up on Wednesday at some point uh, in between like noon and 8 p.m., somewhere in there. I film usually on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Today's we're filming on Wednesday and we'll air it today. Um, and there you go. The length of this study, I'm guessing it's gonna be about 18, 19 weeks to go through this. There's uh, 16 chapters, but like this first one, there's a lot of content to get through. And in our past studies, like Acts, we covered nearly a chapter every week. Um, but with Romans, it's a lot of stuff. So on that note, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, that was our intro to me and to the study. Uh, now, Romans. What is the book of Romans? What is it? First of all, it is... Um, a letter. It is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, the key verse of Romans we're actually going to hit on today is Romans 1.16. In fact, I'm going to read that. We are actually opening up our text. Uh, Romans 1.16 we're going to hit on today, and it is the key verse for the whole book, I would say. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. That's our key verse for the whole book. That's what Paul's going to be talking about, is the gospel and the power of God that brings salvation to everyone, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And we'll talk about that. Um, the theme for today's chunk that we're covering in uh, the first 17 verses is basically a greeting for a group of people that Paul hasn't met before. Unlike his other letters that we're going to talk about, um, this is his sixth letter that he has written. Uh, but the previous five, he had visited those churches before. This is the first letter that he is writing to a church he's never actually been to. And the application, the takeaway for today, is this question of what is holding you back as a believer in a relationship with God, what's hindering your relationship with God? What is preventing you from growing in your faith with God? What's holding you back? And we'll tie back around that to the very end, but I want at the beginning to let you know that's where we're going. Okay, so what is Roman? It's a, uh, it's a letter. It was written by Paul in AD 57, uh, around that, probably spring of AD 57. He wrote it from Corinth in Greece. Uh, on his third missionary journey. So if this is your first book, we, we just went through Acts, which uh, Acts 13 all the way through the end is a look at the Apostle Paul and his three missionary journeys that he goes on. He starts from Antioch and his first missionary journey. Uh, he stays pretty close to home. Um, uh, and then his second journey, he goes a little bit further. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, I'll pull up a map here that shows um, his different missionary journeys. And then his third missionary journey, uh, he expands the furthest. Uh, but the, the, the farthest that he ever goes uh, is to Greece in his third missionary journey. And he's on a little bit of a hiatus in his third missionary journey. He's about to go to Jerusalem um, to bring some offerings from the churches in Macedonia. Uh, and he's spending some time in Corinth uh, for about three months. And he knows that he wants to go to Rome. Why does he want to go to Rome? Paul is the apostle uh, to the Gentiles. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But... His goal, his charge is to present the gospel to the world. And so the first hub that you see is in Jerusalem and it spreads from Jerusalem. The second hub is in Antioch in Syria, uh, which is where Paul uh, is his hub that he launches from for his different uh, missionary journeys. Paul knows that Rome is the hub of the, of the world at that time. All roads lead to Rome. And he knows that if he wants the gospel, the good news of Christ, to spread even further, he needs to have a big impact in Rome. And he knows, he knows God is sending him to Rome. And we'll see that as he talks about it. Um, but he first needs to go to Jerusalem. So what is unique about this sixth letter 
The previous five uh, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians are all written to people he knows in churches that he helped start, dealing with specific issues that he has heard that that church is dealing with. Romans, as I've said, is to a group of people, some of them he's met, and we'll see that in chapter 16, but um, that will get into the purpose of the letter here in a second, is why does he write it? We'll talk about that in just a second. What are some unique things about this? Uh, it's his most systematic of his letters. It's almost, some would say, it's more of an essay than a letter. Um, it's almost like uh, <laughs> the owner's manual to Christianity of what does it mean to be a Christian. Another unique element is that this is the last letter that Paul will write before his in period in prison. Uh, as you will recall, if you joined us going through Acts, Paul's going to go to Jerusalem where he is going to be arrested. He's going to spend two years um, in Caesarea, uh, and then he is going to then uh, travel all the way out to Rome where he's going to spend two years uh, or more in almost like a house arrest. Um, and then he is going to be released. He's going to go on his fourth missionary journey. Then he's going to be arrested again and be back in Roman, uh, Roman imprisonment. From prison is when he is going to write um, the rest of the letters that he writes. Uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, and 2 Timothy is the final letter that he writes in his second Roman uh, imprisonment. There are two letters that he doesn't write uh, from prison, which is uh, Titus and 1 Timothy. He writes from his fourth missionary journey. So the point being is, is that um, he hasn't gone through that fire yet uh, of being in prison, but it's through that time that he spends in prison that we get so many, a bulk of his letters that he writes. Okay, so what is the purpose for this letter? I need to keep to my notes. What is the purpose for this letter? Some believe that it is to present and prepare the way for his coming to Rome. He hasn't been to that church before, and so he wants to present his perspective, uh, to present his doctrine, and that is going to be a humongous thing that he talks about throughout Romans, is Christian doctrine. So he's trying to um, present his credentials, so to speak, to the church that he wants to come and visit. Uh, uh, some believe that it's to present the basic system of salvation to a church that has not received the teaching of the apostle before. Uh, others believe that it's ex to explain the relationship between Jew and Gentile. And we're going to see this a lot in chapter 14. There is a tension that exists in Rome um, and in the world at this point of Christian Jews, Jews who believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and Gentile believers in Christ. And the difference between that and, and what does it mean to be a, a believer in God? Uh, whether Jew or not, and do we need to follow the law? Do we need to be baptized? Do we need to follow all of the rules, the ceremonies, all the stuff of Judaism now that we are saved by grace? And we're going to talk about that by faith. Ultimately, um, some believe that it's Paul's ultimate manifesto of faith, uh, owner's manual of the Christian faith. I like that as well. Um, and all of these are just... Uh, um, ideas of why he wrote it. Um, I do like there's some extra biblical sources that we can look at. There's three of them that I want to reference right now. Um, the NIV uh, application commentary uh, by Douglas Wu says, Romans teaches us what human beings really are like and what they need. What God has done to provide a way of escape from our estrangement and mortality and what a lifestyle that grows out of a Christian worldview looks like. And that's one of the important takeaways that I want to make sure that the believer hears. It's not just about salvation in Christ. It means what, what does it mean to be a believer and what does it mean that we are free from sin as believers? Uh, another um, good explanation for the letter is simply put, what is the good news of Jesus Christ? Why do people need to hear it? How can they experience it? What will it mean for their future? And what does the good news have to do with everyday life? These are the things we're going to uh, discover and go through in Romans. I want to read uh, the Holman New Testament commentary. I want to read just real quick um, their overview of it. And I love this. The length and size of Paul's letter have caused some to argue that Romans is simply his theological magnum opus, 
which just happened to be sent to the church at Rome. While it undoubtedly has widespread distribution and value to other churches, it was still written specifically to the believers at Rome for the purpose outlined above. The maturity and depth of the letter is occasioned no doubt by the maturity of Paul's thinking and ministry in AD 57, the end of his third missionary journey. He was full of insights and spiritual wisdom about what it takes to bring both halves of humanity, Jews and Gentiles, together for God's purpose in one body. Additionally, the size and importance of Rome and the church established there required an impressive presentation. It must be thorough, convincing, and irrefutable. Finally, the apparent lack of direct apostolic presence in the church and the size of the task ahead of Paul required him to write a letter that was exhaustive in scope, enthusiastic in tone, and equipping in result. Therefore, Paul's letter to the Romans reflects the warp and woof of his personal and apostolic agenda. Yep, that's exactly what it says. Warp and woof of his personal apostolic agenda to declare the riches of the grace of God to the uttermost of the earth. Being practical as well as idealistic, Paul knew that another stepping stone, first Jerusalem, then Antioch, would be needed for the extension of the gospel, and Rome was the obvious choice. The purpose of his letter to the Romans is to teach them, equip them, and unite them in the faith, a church that would serve as his connecting point to the outside world must be mature, a mature church, one that would support him prayerfully as well as maturely and be a strong, as strong when he returned as when he left. And that is exactly what Rome will become. It is through Rome's embracing of the gospel that the good news of Jesus Christ spreads throughout the entire world. And the last quote that I want to give as far as the explanation of the letter is from Martin Luther, who writes, Romans is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word, but heart, but, but know it by heart. But, uh, but wow, well, I am ruining this. Sorry, Martin Luther, let me start again. Romans is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. It can never be read or pondered too much. And the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. It's Martin Luther. And today's passage had humongous impact on Luther and the whole entire Protestant Reformation. We're going to talk about that. Okay, so who is the author? Uh, It is impossible to fully appreciate anything written by the Apostle Paul without understanding the radical transformation of his life. That's from Holman, which we just read. Um, So who is Paul? Paul was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. And when you read Acts, Saul of Tarsus uh, is a key character. He was a Jew, and not just uh, any Jew. He was a Pharisee, a Pharisee among Pharisees, trained in Jerusalem by Gamaliel. Gamaliel was uh, the he was said to have been the best at encapsulating the law in one single individual. We learn from Acts that Saul was a major persecutor of the early church. Stephen Stoning, he was there, he condoned it. He actually got letters from the Sanhedrin to go out to to not just Jerusalem, but to area cities to be able to grab Christians, people who were part of this new sect of Judaism, that from his perspective were Uh, uh, heathens that were spitting out blasphemy and he was bringing them back to Jerusalem to be killed for blasphemy. This is Saul. And then he meets Jesus. And we see that in Acts 9. We see uh, Saul on the road to Damascus on his journey to persecute Christians. He has a very, very personal encounter with Jesus and he literally gets knocked off of his horse. And that leads to an amazing transformation of Saul. He will be continued to be called Saul and go by Saul all the way until uh, halfway through his first missionary journey when 
we see Luke, who is the author of Acts, start to call him Paul. The reason for that is not because he's, his name changed to Paul and his Christian name is Paul and his previous name was Saul, uh, kind of like Simon and Peter, where Jesus changes the apostle Simon's name to Peter. Saul and Paul, it was very, very common for people in that day to have multiple names especially for Jews. You would have your Jewish Hebrew name. That was Saul. Saul's Hebrew name was Saul. But his Greek name was Paul. And the charge that Christ gave him was to be the apostle to the Gentiles, which is why when he embraces that and we see him come into his leadership halfway through his first missionary journey, that's when he starts being known as Paul. So the background information that you need to know about Paul is, is that he knows the law, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. He knows it better than anybody. He knows it every dot and tittle of the law. He knows it very, very well. And by this point, he has been a believer, a Christian for nearly 25 years. He's been spent the last 15 years on his missionary journeys. He is a solid believer. And the more you stand on your faith, the stronger you will become in your relationship with God and the more you will learn about God's character. So we know Paul is a solid guy, solid guy that is giving us this letter to the Romans. Okay, uh... Yeah, that covers who the author is. Who is the audience? Who is he writing this to? Well, it's the church in Rome. Who started the church in Rome? We don't know. We do not know who actually started the church in Rome. We know from Acts chapter 2 that there were Romans that were in Jerusalem at Pentecost. So Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, it's a whole other talk that I can give. In fact, you can go back and watch uh, the first few talks that I did on Acts. Um, this is shortly after Jesus' uh, crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection uh, from the dead where he was seen by more than 500 people across a 40-day period. People, eyewitnesses, saw the risen Christ. And then Pentecost the Jewish holiday and feast of Pentecost, the believers were gathered together and the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened. Jesus specifically said, it is good that I leave you so that you may receive the helper. The helper is the Holy Spirit. Witness to this were hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people who saw the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was a miraculous thing where people from throughout uh, uh, the Roman Empire were witness to it, but they heard the apostles speaking and proclaiming the gospel, but each of them heard it in their own language. It's a totally miraculous thing that happened. After this, we see Peter, the first real head of the Christian church, give an amazing, amazing sermon, and thousands of people were saved. And this is the start of the Christian church. And we know from Acts chapter 2, specifically Acts 2.10, we know that there were Romans that were there. So it's very likely that those Romans who stayed in Jerusalem for a period to be trained and taught under Peter then went back to Rome. We also do know from Romans 16 that there's a lot of people that Paul personally knew. People who joined him on his first, second, third missionary journey that he met there. Priscilla and Aquila are a great example of a pair of people who are now in Rome that have a home church. We actually know because of Romans 16 that there are five, minimum of five, home churches that happen. We know because Paul specifically calls them out and he greets them. What else do we know about Rome at this time? Well, we know in AD 49, some eight years previous to the writing of Romans, that the emperor Claudius kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. Why? Um, specifically, in AD 49, Emperor Claudius, out of ex exasperation with squabbles among the Jews about Christus, it's Christ, probably a reference to Jesus, claims to be the Christ issued an edict, this is the emperor, issued an edict that required all Jews to leave Rome. Jewish Christians like Priscilla and Aquila of Acts 18.2 would have been included. That's why 
Paul is able to have met Priscilla and Aquila before he actually ever goes to Rome because they weren't in Rome at the time. So what does this tell us about Rome? We know that Rome at that time, so five years after the exile of all the Jews, the Jews started coming back into Rome. But we know that the demographic of the the recipients of this letter were mostly Gentiles. We do know because of Paul's words that there are Jews that are present, but the the guess is that more than half are Gentiles. Probably around 70% are Gentiles, but there's still a percentage that are Jewish in heritage, and he's going to talk about that. Um, okay, there you go. So now, um, a half hour into this study, and we're actually going to finally start opening up the scripture and start reading it. I hope that that background has been helpful because it's important to understand the context of the environment at that time to understand the historical cultural context of why Paul's writing, who he's writing this to. So let's open up our Bibles. My goal is, is that, so I, I personally, I fill my Bible up with notes. Um, and feel free to do that as well if you like. Uh, if you like to keep your, your, your scripture completely clean, I totally get that. And you have a notebook for your notes, great, do that. But have your Bible out in front of you, have your notepad, have your pen uh, ready to go because we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Uh, there's two sort of chunks that we're going to cover. And the way that I do this is I want to make sure we read all of Romans out loud. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first seven verses and then we're going to come back and uh, really dig in to what is happening in these. Then I'll do verse, verses 8 through 17, and then we'll come back and dig through those. I personally, my Bible is an NIV. Whether you have uh, a King James, um, uh, an NSV, an ESV, uh, an NASB, there's so many different translations, and uh, which is great. Uh, I actually have a video that explains the different translations and why we have them. Um, in fact, at the end of this, I'm going to include that video uh, down in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of your screen if you want to learn about the different translations. If you don't have an NIV, what I would suggest that you do is just sit back and listen as I read this the first time rather than being caught up in the nuances of uh, the different wordings between the different translations. Just step back and just take it all in. Then when I go in and dissect it, then look at your translation and the specific words and, and take your notes. Okay, so let's uh, uh, begin. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in the power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we have received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Paul's opening, his greeting. And verse 7 of these seven verses, the last one, well, I mean, this is, the, it's easy to understand verse 7. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called by his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. To all my Christians in Rome, what's up? It's basically what he says. But verses 1 through 6 are so jam-packed full of content. Uh, it, it's packed, absolutely packed. And I'm going to try in the next half hour or less, 25 minutes or less, I'm going to try to dissect this. So first of all, Paul. We already talked about that. Paul, Saul, same guy. A servant of Christ Jesus. So that word servant also means slave. And 
the readers, specifically the Gentile readers, would have had the same reaction to his intro of saying a slave for Christ as a non-believer or a person who's brand new in their faith would have about hearing it right now. He is saying, I am a slave of Christ Jesus. A slave is a very harsh term, and especially for historical perspective in Rome at that time, I mean, a slave was not a good term. Slaves very much existed in Rome. Um, Watch Gladiator. I mean, that's obviously not a scriptural uh, Bible-based movie, but that shows there's lots of reasons why a person would be a slave, whether you were conquered by the Romans uh, or whether you had a debt. There are a, a lot of reasons, but a slave, especially in Rome at this time, was a lesser individual. They were not on the same level. And so Paul saying that he is a slave of Christ Jesus, they would have been taken aback by that. But the Jew who is listening to this, who knew their Old Testament, and to the Christian who's listening to this that knows where I'm going with this, they would have recognized this as an actual, uh, actually an awesome thing, an endearing thing. The Greek word that Paul uses here is doulos, doulos. And that word, D-O-U-L-O-S, is the spelling of this Greek word, and it means bond slave. Now let me explain. The Jewish perspective on slavery. Some people, skeptics of the Bible, say that Christianity and Judaism support slavery. That's not true. Anywhere you see slavery in the Bible, you will see it controlled, and if the Jewish system were followed, it would be eradicated. Why do I say that? Because the books of law define slavery that anytime you, you gain a slave, and there's different reasons why you would receive a slave. One, if the Israelites were going out into battle and they conquered a people group, you could choose to either be killed or become a slave. So if you were a conquered people, if your city was conquered, you had that choice. Another, if you were in debt, you wouldn't, they wouldn't send the debt collectors after you and they wouldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, file for bankruptcy. You would become a slave until you had paid that debt. But in Jewish law, slavery was only held for six years and on the seventh year of your servitude, you were freed. That was required by Jewish law. So one of the things that was an option that was given to all slaves that the Jews were required to give is that you offer your slave the opportunity to stay and be in, in your service as an employee, as a member of your household, as a family member. The Jews were called to treat their slaves so well that when their servitude time was up, they would want to stay. In fact, the law said that you were supposed to bless them with such abundance as you had been blessed so that they leave your household far better than they, than, than they were when they first became a member of your household as a slave. But such an extent, you're supposed to treat them so well that they would want to stay. That was where the word doulos came from, is this idea of a slave by choice, a bond slave that chooses to stay. In fact, the scripture that I wanna reference for this is Deuteronomy 15, 12. So why don't you uh, uh, put your marker here, leave a finger here, and flip all the way to Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book uh, of the Pentateuch, um, it's the fifth book of, of the Torah, uh, where we get the law, is these first five books. And we're going to uh, open up to Deuteronomy 15, verse 12. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year, you must let them go free. That's obviously talking about if they're your slave, uh, they must be set free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply, supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you, because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an awl and push it through his earlobe into the door and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your female servants. Pierce his ear is the idea there. Do not consider it a hardship to set your servant free. 
because their service to you these six years has been worth twice as much as that of a hired hand. And the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. So that's the context of that word servant is a bond slave. Paul is saving them a servant by choice in employment of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're 40 minutes in and we've gotten three words. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Called to be an apostle. What does the word apostle mean? Apostle means sent one. Paul was called in the same way that the first apostles were called. We know from Matthew 4.18 that Jesus uh, called Peter and Andrew and he said, come, follow me. And in following verses, verse 21 and 22 of chapter 4 of Matthew, he calls James and John. In the same way, but different and totally unique, he calls Paul on his road to Damascus. Um, in fact, let's read that. Acts 26, 16. So leave your finger here or your marker and let's uh, go back to Acts chapter 26. Acts 26, 16. This is uh, Paul telling the story of his uh, meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. And these are the words of Jesus to Paul. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people, that's the Jews, and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. That is Paul being called by Jesus. Now, uh, fiddling back over to Romans, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Set apart is an interesting term and word. And the root of that word, I looked it up, the root for that Greek word is the same root word that the Hebrew term and word Pharisee comes from. And I thought this was really interesting. Pharisee means set apart. Now, I'm not going to go into huge detail of Pharisees, but Paul, as Saul, was a Pharisee among Pharisees. Pharisees were set apart. How were they set apart? By their keeping of the law. Pharisees kept the law, the rules. It's not just the Ten Commandments. There's 600 plus rules in the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Bible. There's 600 plus rules. And the Pharisees kept them to the nth degree. They would divide their spices, their salt, their cumin. They would divide out and give nine kernels uh, to themselves and one, uh, a tenth, to God. They would divide everything up. They lived absolutely righteous lives in their mind. And the thing that set them apart was all internal actions that they did following the law. The reason why this is so pivotal on today's study in this talk and looking at Paul is that he was set apart first as a Pharisee based solely on himself and based solely on the things that he did, the works he did. But then when he met Christ, he was now set apart for the gospel, which is in an inversion, the gospel, the good news is all about others. It's all about what Christ has done for us so that we can then do for others. Paul is saying that he is set apart specifically for the gospel. And I'm going to talk about that when I wrap up, is this idea that when you become a Christian, you are set apart. You were one way, and now you are a new way, a new creation. And the thing that is in the middle is Christ, and that we are called as Christians to be set apart. For the gospel of God, set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel, a great definition that Paul gives is in 1 Corinthians. So let's flip over to 1 Corinthians, which is our next letter uh, after Romans. Um, oh, 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 yep, is 1 Corinthians, and we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15.1. So this is obviously a letter that Paul writes to the Corinthian church, uh, and he says, 1 Corinthians 15.1, now, brothers and sisters, 
I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still alive today, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. That is a phenomenal definition of the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared and now is at the right hand of God. And we're going to talk more about that, but that is the gospel. Uh, F.F. Bruce defines the gospel as the joyful proclamation of the death and resurrection of God's Son and of the consequent, uh, and, and of the, um, consequent amnesty and liberation which men and women may enjoy through faith in him. Let me read that again. I flubbed it up a little bit. The joyful proclamation of the death and resurrection of God's Son and of the consequent amnesty and liberation which men and women may enjoy through faith in him. And that's going to be what I'm going to hit at the very end, is that it's not just a get-out-of-jail-free card, that we are freed from the law of sin and death throughout our life. We are free from sin. Okay, so now we're going to continue on going back to Romans. I know there's so much. This beginning chunk is so heavy laden, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I've got to cover all these things. So uh, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. I'm going to read this whole first uh, two verses again. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart, For the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. He promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, J. Barton Payne found more than 574, specifically, found 574 references to the Messiah in the Old Testament. Now, 574 means every single little nuance that references a Messiah in some way, he cites as being a a, a messianic prophecy, a prophecy of Jesus is the Messiah. Alfred uh, Edersham found 456 verses in the Old Testament that speak of a coming Messiah. On the conservative side, there's more than 300 verses that call of a Messiah in the Old Testament, before Jesus was born, and Jesus fulfilled them all. On the conservative side, the 300, he fulfilled them all. And we see actually from Luke 24, 13 through 32, this is the road to Emmaus. Luke goes through this in an encounter that two apostles walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they meet a guy who is Jesus, but they don't recognize him at first, by choice, by Jesus' choice. And Jesus asks them, what's going on? They're like, what do you mean, what's going on? Jesus, we thought was the Messiah, was crucified. And then Jesus then goes and explains how he is present throughout all of Scripture, the entire Hebrew Bible. Jesus explains how he is in the entire breadth of the book. And that's what that means. That's what Paul is saying is the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The prophet spoke of a coming Messiah regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. Now, if you want to, uh, so that specifically, one of the prophecies was that the Messiah would be a descendant of King David. Matthew, in Matthew 1.1, does a phenomenal job of showing the actual lineage that goes all the way from Abraham through King David to Jesus being born. 
go watch. That's the very first Bible study I ever did, Matthew 1.1. I did it on the, the beach in Nantucket. But I go through and explain how miraculous that line, lineage is and the fact that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy of being a descendant of David. And that's what Paul's talking about here regarding the son who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we have received grace and apostleship to call the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. That last little bit, verse five and six, is basically him saying, through him I was called to proclaim the good news to the Gentiles, which is you. You are the Gentiles who are called to be disciples of Christ. And that's who I'm greeting. There you go, that's his greeting. Now let's pick it up on verse eight. This chunk won't take as long, uh, and I apologize, we're already over 50 minutes. Thanks for hanging with me. I'm trying to keep each of these studies to 50 minutes, but sometime, especially this first intro, there's a lot to cover. We're gonna go well over 50 minutes, obviously, because I still have two massive chunks to cover, uh, two big points to make. Hang with me, it'll be worth it. Uh, reading verse eight through 17. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am eager to preach the gospel as to who gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So the second chunk, there are a few key things that I want to hit on. Paul wanted to go to Rome because he knew that his charge of helping to spread the good news needed to go to Rome because it was the center of the known world at that time. And from Rome, it would spread like wildfire. Paul knew this and it was true and it would become that, which is why he really wanted to go to Rome. And that's why he says this, that, that he wants, he's wanted to, to, to go there and travel to Rome, and as well as to Spain, which many do believe, scholars do believe, that in his fourth missionary journey, he does make it all the way to Spain. We don't read that in Acts. We get that from uh, Titus and Timothy. Not gonna go down that tangent. Verse 11, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. I'm not gonna give a talk on the gifts of the Spirit. We are going to talk about that. Romans 12, 6 Paul specifically will explain what the, those gifts are, uh, what the spiritual gifts are. They are not the giftings of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is not a spiritual gift. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit. That is an imparting of the Holy Spirit that is not a spiritual gift. If you want to read what the spiritual gifts are, flip over to Romans 12, 6 where it's talking about um, uh, teaching and prayer, um, etc. These are gifts that we're all blessed with each in our own unique ability. Uh, and so that's what he's talking about there is, is that we will be mutually beneficial to each other. Now this verse, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. That's the main point of this entire book is that Salvation comes through Christ. Now, I'm going to explain what that means in a second. Uh, I'm actually going to show you how going through Romans 
you understand what salvation means. And I'm gonna hit on around seven verses that show the, the gospel of what the gospel is. But before I do that, what I want to do is um, talk about verse 17. We'll come back to verse 16 because I got a question for you uh, in what's hindering you. What is hindering you and holding you back from becoming the man or woman God has, has in store for you to be? I want you to think on that. I said it at the beginning, I said it now, and we'll come back to it. Verse 17, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as is written, the righteous will live by faith. This single verse changed the world. How did it change the world? Martin Luther. Let's talk about Martin Luther, Martin Luther for just a second. For uh, believers uh, uh, who have been Christians for a long time, you, you very likely know who Martin Luther is uh, and the pivotal man that he is and was in Christianity today. Uh, those who have never heard of Martin Luther, you probably recognize Luther, Lutheran. Lutheranism uh, is a denomination of Christianity that is based on the teachings of Martin Luther. Who was Martin Luther? Martin Luther was a German monk uh, that lived in the 1500s, and uh, he was a Roman Catholic. At the time, uh, the only Bible that was around was the Latin Vulgate, and you had to know Latin. And only the very well-educated people spoke Latin. The high priests, the priests uh, in the Catholic Church, um, and the very, very well-educated people spoke Latin. Bibles were not prevalent. Uh, you would go to church and you were dependent on what the priest said uh, to be able to understand uh, what the Bible read. And it was a very dark time in church history. This is also a time in which uh, we have what we're called indulgences. Indulgences still exist today. It's, it's dumbed down drastically. But the idea of indulgences, it's a Catholic uh, tradition. And the idea is to mitigate, to lessen your required penance in purgatory, you would give money. The idea simply is, is that to lessen your sin debt, you would give money. And the idea at first, uh, I mean, it's not biblical at all. It is not biblical. The whole idea of purgatory isn't biblical either. But the idea was is that that sin that you have that's eating away that you're guilty of, give us money. And then we'll forgive that sin for you and you won't have to pay for that sin in purgatory. It, that is not biblical, and that led to a lot of messed up stuff. And it was a very dark time in church history in which you had some very corrupt individuals. When you put a person in power and you have no accountability and no one is able to call, call uh, them into check, um, people are sinful. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And that happened. And Martin Luther was very upset by the fact of all of these works, all of these things, that salvation was a very hard thing to attain and you had to do all these penance, all this work, all these things. And then he read verse 17 of Romans 1 from the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. From first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. It was that verse alone that Martin Luther meditated on and thought on and, and, and really did some hard work on, which led him to write the 95 Theses, which he nailed to the church door in Wittenberg, which led to the Protestant Reformation. This also led to Martin Luther translating the Bible into German so that the German people, the everyday person, could open up their Bibles and they didn't have to go and get their scripture from the priest. They didn't have to be held to whatever the priest said. They could open up their scriptures and they could learn about God individually. And that's the whole idea of the Protestant Reformation is this idea that it's by faith, not by works, 
that we receive salvation. I'm not gonna go down this road of uh, Protestant versus Catholic and this question of is it by works or by faith? Simply put, it's by faith that works. A person who has faith, you will see works in their life. Don't wanna go down that tangent. But that's the first 17 verses. And it's jam-packed. But now what I wanna do is I wanna actually talk about what's coming next. The next few weeks are going to be very dark. And the reason why is that Paul is going to paint a very, very dark picture. He's going to go through and he's going to show how we all have fallen short. And the idea, the best example that I can give, uh, my wife and I have been married for 18 years. Um, we've been engaged for, well, it'd be 20 years on January 1st, New Year's Eve is when I proposed of, um, of 2000. Yeah, it was 2000. Yeah, is when I proposed. And when I went to buy Salisha's engagement ring, uh, one of the things that they do at the ring shops is they put out the diamond on this beautiful black velvet. And the reason why they use the black velvet is that with that blackness as the background, the diamond looks gorgeous. It's a sales technique that they use. Uh, anybody who's bought a diamond recently, it's a very common practice. It's a dark cloth, whether it's black or purple, but they make sure, or dark blue, they make sure it's really dark so that the brilliance of the diamond is gonna shine through. That's exactly what Paul is gonna do. Next week, we are gonna dig into the wrath against si sinful humanity. I am, I've got a heaviness in my heart for next week's lesson because of the stuff we're gonna talk about. It gets really dark. Um, but once we get through that, we are gonna see the brilliance of that diamond that is the gospel. I wanna go through a few passages and I want to just give you really quick, and I know we're already well over an hour, about a few minutes, and I apologize. But I don't, this is good stuff and, and, and I want you to get this message. So be ready, we're gonna fly through scripture now. All in Romans, these are all things that Paul gives us in Romans. First, we're gonna flip over to Romans 3, 9. Romans 3, 9, so for me it's just one page. 3, 9, and we're actually gonna pick it up halfway through uh, verse nine. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And further on, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What Paul is saying is that we're all sinners. We're all screwed up. Even your best deed is filthy rags. That really good thing that you did, yeah, you still had an alter alternative, ulterior motive in doing it. We all have fallen short. That's the first point. We're all sinners. No one is good. Jesus Christ alone. Even Billy Graham was a sinner. And we can actually see that when you look, when you look at some of the amazing uh, men of faith and women of faith that have fallen from grace. You can see these mega church leaders that have horrible moral falls. Why? Because even the best of us, we start out with great intentions, but when you have absolute power that is unchecked, we are sinful and pride will take over and you will see the progression of a person who has good intent, but it gets tweaked and it can get tweaked and, and sin can, can, can just weed its evil way in there and we are all susceptible to it. That's the first point. The second point, the price of sin. Uh, Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23. Flip over to Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the first part of that, the wage of sin is death. Our God is 100% just, meaning that everybody who does X will receive the penalty associated with whatever that sin is. What is that penalty? Death. 100% everyone is going to be judged by God and they will receive the penalty for that sin. A lot of the world sees Christianity as just that, that when we die, our good deeds are going to be weighed. It's going to be this gigantic scale. And when we go before uh, Peter at the gates of heaven, he is going to weigh our good deeds versus our bad deeds, which, yeah, that's true. But the difference is, as a Christian, Christ paid that penalty for you. So yes, you will be in front of the, the, the great white throne judgment, is what it's called, where everyone will be held accountable. But the Christian, they get to go before the, the Bema seat judgment of Christ. And the difference of that is, is that when that judgment comes, there's a stamp on your uh, violation, your parking ticket, your list of all your sins, there's a stamp on that paid in full that was put there by Christ when he died for you. As propitiation is the word, in replace of your death, he, the only one who could stand in your place, stood in your place. So on the one hand, God is 100% just. Everybody who does X will receive the penalty for that, which is why sin penalty is death. But he's 100% full of grace and mercy, 100% merciful, meaning that every single person who believes can receive his mercy. One of the things that people say is that why would a loving God send anyone to hell? He doesn't send anyone to hell. They send themselves there. So number three, Christ died in our place. Romans 5, 8. So we're going to flip back. Romans 5. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the whole point of it. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid that debt that we could not pay so that we receive his mercy and not judgment. The next point. What do we need to do to receive that salvation? Is it works? Is it things that we have to do? Do we have to become a member of a church? Do you need to subscribe now? And give your money. Send your check for $2,000 to this address below and you then will be saved. What do we need to do in order to become saved? Is it by works? Is it by going on a missions trip? Is it by your tithe? No. Uh, let's flip it over to Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It is by faith alone. What does God want? What does God need? Your heart. That's all he needs. Does he need your money? Nope. Does he need you to go out in a mission field? Nope. Does he need me to be doing these Bible studies so that you hear the word and that you're saved? Nope. He doesn't need any of that. He doesn't need us. But he loves us so much that he died for us. And the one thing we have to do is say thank you and accept that gift. And if you've never done that, 
In a few minutes, I'm going to pray that prayer. And you can pray that prayer with me, and you can do that. But there's more. It doesn't end there. And to the Christian who's been a Christian for 30 years, who's just going through the motions, going to church on Sunday, but not actually letting it affect their life, there's more verses for you. Romans 5.1. We're going all over the place. Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of our salvation and accepting the gift, we are at peace with God. We are one with God. We are in a right relationship with God. We get eternal life when we die. We get to go to heaven. Next verse, 838. Romans 838. Romans 8, 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can get in between you and God's love that you don't put there yourself. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. God loves you so much. Now, can you lose your salvation? Can you step away from your relationship with God? That's a whole other subject. But God's love for you is absolute. And Romans 8.1 is the last of these ones that we're going to go through. Romans 8.1. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Condemnation. Condemnation is judgment, but it's judgment unto death. It's different than guilt and it's different than judgment in its own right. Condemnation is judgment with the penalty being death. So now, the point being, you're no longer bound by sin. You no longer have to be shackled by the weight of the chains that have held you down for so long. You now, Jesus has broken those chains. But you have to do the work. To free yourself from those. Jesus has done all the work needed, but you have to, like Romans 12, excuse me, Hebrews 12, 1 says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great witness, let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles. We need to throw it off. And so here's my question to you, the Christian out there, my question to you is this, is that the Bible says that we are set free from the law of sin and death. What is in your life right now that is blocking your relationship with God? Romans 8 clearly establishes that we are set free from that law of sin. So do you feel free? Or do you feel like there's something that's there? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Christianity is not a destination. It's a journey. And the challenge that we face on a day-to-day -day basis as Christians is to die to ourselves and to ask God, what is in our lives that's hindering us? What is sinful that is in our lives that's holding us back, either from our relationship with God or our relationship with others? A dangerous prayer to pray, which uh, uh, Pastor Rick at our church um, prayed this just this past week, asked us to pray this, and I'm going to ask you to pray this. Ask God to reveal the things in your life that are holding you back. It might be a sinful habit. It might be actually um, an issue that you have with somebody else. 
Jesus actually specifically talks about this, Matthew 5, 23. This is in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus specifically says, if you're kneeling and praying and you go and you, you want to bring your tithe or your offering, but then you realize that your brother or your sister has something against you, stop. Leave your, your offering. Leave the church. Go and be reconciled with your brother or your sister and then come back and make your offering. The Bible talks about the fact that, that our prayers can be hindered based on sin that lives in our life and relationships that are messed up. Some of you right now are thinking of someone that you need to reconcile that relationship with and you're afraid to do that. It's a hard phone call to make. It's a hard cup of coffee to have. But that is holding you back from growing closer to God and achieving the peace that God wants you to have that surpasses all understanding. Uh, Philippians 4.6, one of my favorite verses. Got it right here, Philippians 4.6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your minds and your hearts through Christ Jesus. Give it to God. Pray about it. Pray what and ask what is holding you back. It's a, it's a, it's a scary pray, prayer to pray because you're a little nervous about what God's going to show you. But be strong and know that God will help you through it and that he will guard your heart and your mind. It doesn't mean that he's going to solve whatever it is. It does mean that you'll have peace about it. And that ultimately is uh, my goal, is to have peace in my relationship with God. So that's the takeaway for today. For the believer out there, I challenge you to ask God what's holding you back. And then to take charge of whatever that thing is, to work through it. But the only way you're going to work through it is to surrender it to God. But if you never prayed that prayer and all the things that I'm talking about, we're, we're going to talk about, I mean, I just went through the entire 16 chapters of Romans. I just summed them up. And that's what we're going to go through. That's what we're going to talk about in the coming uh, 18 weeks or so is what it means to be a Christian. And if you are not one, or if you say that you're a Christian, to check off that box of that demographic, yeah, I believe in God, but you've never actually prayed that prayer, or you might, have, you might say, well, I was baptized when I was uh, eight weeks old, so I'm obviously saved. I'm gonna invite you to join me in that prayer right now. If you've been a Christian for 30 years, pray it again. If you've already prayed the prayer, pray it again. But if you've never accepted Christ as your savior, I'm gonna pray that right now. It's very simple, it's very easy. One of my favorite verses, it's the first one that's up here, is Revelation 3.20. Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. And to him who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And that was the verse for me when I was a freshman in college at the University of Colorado at Boulder that led me to take a walk in the woods down by Boulder Creek and pray the prayer of salvation. Now, I didn't know Romans 10, 9, and 10 and pray it exactly the way that I'm going to pray it with you. All I said was, God, I, I know you're real and I want to change and I invite you into my life. And that's exactly what it is. And that started for me a roller coaster ride that has led me where I am today. And I wouldn't go back and change that for anything. But it wasn't all roses. It's, it's, change is hard, but when you go through it, you will be better for it and Christ will be with you. So I invite everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes, unless you're driving, and repeat after me this prayer of salvation. Lord, I need you. I invite you into my life. Change me 
from the inside out. Change my heart into the man or woman you want me to be. Thank you for the work that you did on the cross. Thank you for saving me. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, for that person who just prayed that prayer, I pray that you will bring alongside them people that can help them and that can stand on this new faith. And I pray that you will give them a passion to study their scripture more and more. And Lord, for that person that's been a, a Christian for the past 30 years, I pray that you would reignite that fire and that they would have the courage to be able to pray for you to light up their life and show them the things that are hindering their prayers to you, the things that are holding them back, and that they would have the courage, Lord, with you by their side, carrying them through it, to have the courage to challenge those things and to change and to, to, to stand on you as their savior. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Wow. Wow, this was a long one. Uh, we didn't hit 90 minutes, which I think is my record when we went through uh, talking about the end times um, in Acts tw or, uh, uh, Matthew 24. Um, one of the things that I want you to do, if you have questions, email them to me, info at davebigler.com. I would like you to email me and tell me a little about who you are, what you're going through in life, where you live, and if you did pray that prayer for God to show you what's hindering you, what is uh, something you need to get rid of, if you want to, share that with me. But if you have specific questions about the first 17 verses of Romans, email me those. I may very well include uh, my answer to your question in the next study that we give next week, but I might hold it off to go through all the way at the end uh, when we hit Acts, Acts. Wrong book, Dave, when we hit Romans uh, 16. I love you guys. Thank you very much for joining me on this journey. I challenge you, make the time every week to get into the Bible and study it. Read the rest of Acts chapter one and you'll understand why I have a heavy heart about what I have to teach next week. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Oh,